Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. My name is Kate Paisani, and I am the director of CARLA at the University of Minnesota, and we are sponsoring this talk today. So we are delighted today to have Leah Shepard Carey presenting. Leah is a PhD candidate in the second language education program at the University of Minnesota. And we are thrilled to learn that she just um, accepted a job at Drake University and will be joining the faculty there in the fall. Um, she's a longtime friend of Carla, former Carla fellow, and we're just really pleased that she's finishing up and moving on in her career. So today she's going to be talking about translanguaging pedagogies in elementary classrooms, widening possibilities with long-term teacher researcher collaboration. We will leave the chat open during the talk, but we wanna let you know that Leah will be handling questions at the end. So if you wanna use the chat to back channel during the talk, that's more than welcome. And then we'll take your questions at the end. So I will turn things over to Leah. Welcome Leah. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm so honored that so many people from around the world are here. That's surprising. So thank you for making time in your schedule to come to this. And so Kate introduced my topic. And today I'm really going to be talking about um, not necessarily all the pedagogies I've done with my long term teacher researcher dissertation project on translanguaging pedagogies, but how the um, how our relationship facilitated our successes and some of the constraints in that. Um, so I'll just move you through some of the background on my study. And so the growth in translanguaging pedagogies has really sparked interest across the fields of language, literacy, and general education as educators and educational institutions seek to provide more equitable learning environments for multilingual children. And so most of us know what translanguaging approaches are, but just to clarify, they're approaches that intentionally include multilingual children's languages or dynamic linguistic repertoire in learning and assessment to um, enrich their learning and provide access to con content, but also honor students' multilingual and multicultural identities. But despite the rise, multilingualism really has yet to be embedded in curriculum in English medium K-12 context. And so um, we know that research demonstrates the positive impacts of teacher researcher collaboration in education, and this creates changes in practice and changes in beliefs. But although translanguaging pedagogies utilize collaborative approaches, we really actually don't hear a lot about the processes of collaboration. And so I'm going to talk and go a little more in depth on that today. But my friend um, and colleague Zhang Feng Tian and I um, really see the potential of collaboration and kind of illuminating these collaborative processes um, to further translanguaging pedagogies, especially in TESOL settings. And so here, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but teacher researcher partnerships as I said, have been beneficial in translanguaging pedagogies because they can lead to both large scale change. So if you're familiar with the CUNY NICE project on translanguaging, um, they involved lots of schools in that project and then also small scale change and reflection on teacher beliefs and practices. Um, and Sam David is also doing this work as well. And we've seen that. Um, and so, um, I want to make sure I define collaboration for purposes of this project. And so while critical approaches in design research aim to resist these strict boundaries of researchers and participants, for purposes of description, um, I'm going to go a little broader um, just to describe it as the joint work between research and participants at any and all points of inquiry and further assert the complexity of this process, meaning it's not equal at all points. And it moves along a continuum, moving constantly and moving between more agentive and involved collaboration from the participants, which includes researcher led activities or more participant led activities as well. And so my study is grounded in participatory design research and I'm drawing on elements in my analysis. And so participatory design research is Actually, the term is newer, but it's an eclectic design-based approach with critical and participatory aims that interrogates and emphasizes collaborative processes and the immediate and broader impacts of inquiry. And so there's a number of important elements in participatory design research, which includes role remediation, which is 
essentially that participants are empowered to, you know, take on more leadership roles and the researchers aren't necessarily taking up typical researcher roles as well. Power relations, we attend to the power relations between the researcher, the participants, the broader community that this project is supposed to be serving. And then another important element of participatory design research is critical historicity, which means thinking about the inequities and injustices that led up to the need for this intervention or these sets of designs. And of course, um, we need to be reflexive participants um, and reflexive researchers, you know, being knowledgeable of our role. And then another um, element I draw upon in my project is sustained open dialogue, which means listening to participants for their perspective on the problems. And so really in PDR, well, there are numerous types of analyses. I mean, it's not a strict methodological paradigm. Um, the collaborative processes as part of you know, the studies that evolve from this should be one unit of analysis in PDR. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today is focusing on our collaborative processes and what became of those. I'm also drawing on a framework that my colleague Zhang Teng Tian and I, who's at um, University of Texas San Antonio, um, developed based off of Ophelia Garcia's stance design shift framework. Um, and so we just developed this as a heuristic for exploring collaboration and also thinking about how we build relationships. And so this framework emphasizes the collaborative aspects of designing and implementing translanguaging pedagogies, further exploring how researchers and teachers equitably negotiate stances, designs, and shifts, and share their respective expertise, hopefully blurring some of these boundaries of and binary notions of like researcher and teacher. And so just quickly, you can read, but um, a co-stance is just collaboratively and respectfully and openly discussing um, their philosophical and ideological belief systems surrounding multilingualism and translanguaging, which in turn informs their pedagogical framework. Um, and then co-design is an iterative design process that involves both teachers and researchers co-planning units, designs, lessons, and assessments to build upon students' linguistic repertoires. And then co-shift is being together, thinking about and reflecting on ways to be responsive and flexible to the students' needs as well. And so going to my research questions, I'm gonna go into talking about my study. Um, is my research, my first research question is what aspects of teacher researcher collaboration were salient in developing and sustaining translanguaging pedagogies in an English medium second grade classroom for two school years. And then what were the pedagogical benefits of this collaboration? I'm mostly gonna be talking about research question one, but I'm also gonna give you a little bit of context of the pedagogies we did as well. Um, and so this was situated in a culturally and linguistically diverse um, second grade English medium classroom with a large Somali population in a large city in the Midwest. Ms. Hassan, this is a pseudonym because she's still working for the school district. Um, she's a Somali American, black woman, multilingual, and she's also a well-known community liaison and advocate. Um, I am the researcher. I'm a white woman. I'm a former ESL teacher in the context with Ms. Hassan, which really benefited and helped us build this long relationship. So we were former colleagues taught together in second grade and continued a partnership um, when I transitioned to my PhD for three years. And so um, because we had this deep relationship, we were able to co-design and co-teach lessons throughout my dissertation study. And so the goal of the project was the development of translanguaging strategies specifically for her reading block, although we did things beyond that, and specifically ones that were helpful for her second grade Somali learners because they, um, students from less common language backgrounds are really underrepresented, underrepresented in the translanguaging literature, especially students who are learning how to read and write for the first time or who have oral literacy backgrounds. Um, in their home language. And so we met weekly and bi-weekly to plan lessons throughout the 2018 to 2019 and then 2019 to 2020 
school year since COVID hit, of course. And so during these um, planning sessions, we would create lesson plans, bilingual materials, choosing texts, pairing, grouping students. So pretty routine things under the scope of like translanguage and pedagogies. And so um, this is kind of, this is how we did our des designed, our design processes. And so we'd have a goal setting meeting at the beginning of every year. And then we'd engage in micro cycles of design, implement, reflect, and then have an evaluation meeting interview um, to see what went well. And so these evaluation interviews took place at mid-year and at the end of year as well, um, just to reflect you know, what was going well and what we needed to change. And so I'm gonna show you some artifacts just so you have an idea of what we've done. We did identity portraits to build the multilingual ecology. We did several multilingual, multicultural read alouds, multilingual morning meeting, bilingual vocabulary charts and instruction, bilingual sentence stems. And we built background across languages because we were lucky enough to have um, Ms. Hassan who spoke Somali and I spoke Spanish because we also had a small Spanish speaking population. So, um, and I just wanna say, we didn't just do this for the Somali kids. We did do it for all of them, but my research focuses on um, the Somali students as well. And so we lucky here in Minnesota to have Somali English read alouds. We ended up reading um, a story on the first day about learning how to say hello in other languages. So together we made an anchor chart. So when the students did their morning meeting, they could greet each other in different languages. Um, and we were lucky the year we instated this, we had a really diverse and multilingual class. So we were able to do a lot. Um, we did identity texts where students um, represented images, words that were of their languages and cultures. This is just a quick like um, smaller lesson plan where we'd identify strategies and skills for a reading lesson, language objectives, a translanguaging objective such as like sequencing a story from beginning, middle, end in both of students' languages. Um, we'd identify vocabulary that we were gonna do bilingually as well. Um, and whoops, and here's just some of the artifacts that we use, sentence stems, bilingual vocabulary. Um, we also did a frere model, so they had to do the word in another language. So pretty typical pedagogies that were derived from um, prior literature as well. Um, whoops, more vocabulary as well. Um, and so for this data, I did ethnographic data collection. Um, in the broader study, I did videos of classroom lessons and collected artifacts. But for this, um, just because I have so much data, because it's over two years, I did, um, I drew from eight planning sessions representative of our design processes. So about 24 hours across the two school years and then four reflective interviews. Um, which were approximately six hours. So those were our evaluative um, interviews at the end of each like several planning cycles. And then my analysis, I engaged in thematic coding. Um, I developed a, I took a priori codes from the literature specifically from my theoretical frameworks Then I merged and modified over several rounds. And Ms. Hassan, um, well, didn't directly help with this analysis. She's been involved in the analyses processes and helped with translation of lessons um, and member checking throughout. Um, so here's just a list of the findings I'm going to go over today. I'm gonna mainly represent these findings from um, quotes. I haven't finished synthesizing all of these findings, so I'm excited for questions. Um, but yeah, so you'll get to see and hear real quotes from our planning sessions. And so I'll start with my research question one. So what aspects of teacher researcher collaboration were salient in developing and sustaining translanguaging pedagogies in an English medium second grade classroom for two school years? And so the first um, theme that was really prevalent was two way design, which I define as the equitable negotiation of ideas and responsibilities in planning. And so Ms. Hassan and I often exchanged ideas with ease, with the ability to go back and forth and not really take personally critiques or new ideas. Um, and so these two themes became really prevalent, which I'll talk about. And so with 
Because of our relationship and my deep knowledge of the context, Mrs. Hassan and I were both able to contribute and negotiate ideas throughout the planning processes. And so this was illuminated through our similarly, um, our really casual and typical conversational norms and this back and forth talk and questioning of each other. And so this isn't like a wow or amazing excerpt, but it just shows how like here, Miss Hassan is throwing out, out an idea about like wanting to do more translation activities with them specifically regarding a book about Ruby Bridges. And I ask her, so you think we should do more translating? And she goes, yeah, I think it'd be amazing if they could write in their own language and present to us. And then I said, yep, you're on the right track for translating. And so in this excerpt, Ms. Hassan is just contributing an initial idea casually, but I affirm and listen, demonstrating levels of trust and respect. And these were types of exchanges were frequent and illustrate the negotiation of ideas that were central to developing these co-designs that maxim maximize students' learning opportunities. Um, and then also um, this just shows us how I was able to draw Ms. Um, Hassan's knowledge of the cultural context and the students. And so we were both able to contribute and negotiate ideas throughout the process, as I said, indicating successful co-designs. Um, and this, with this, although you don't see it in this um, excerpt, there was real acknowledgement of Ms. Hassan's personal and professional commitments. Um, and we agreed that I would bring initial ideas and we would co-shift or um, move towards something that was maybe more relevant because she was the expert of her classroom. And so, um, yeah, so there was just, again, this back and forth equitable sharing of ideas as well. Um, and part of this, when we decided who would do what and when we were able to go back and forth was acknowledging the crucial part of who does the design and why component of PDR. Um, and however, although we didn't, weren't able to enact every single um, idea that we both came up with, um, Ms. Hassan was really able to share ideas that shifted the trajectory of our work because of her expertise. And in PDR, we really recognize, even though these are like normal, typical, like co-planning moments, these moment-to-moment -moment interactions are recognized as part of this larger relationship building process and notions of belonging. Um, so sustained open dialogue was another theme of our two-way design processes um, as well. And so when I talk about sustained, open dialogue. Again, that means we were thinking about issues that were pertinent and specific to Ms. Hassan's um, needs in the classrooms. And so Booker and Goldman define this as holding space for the emergence of multiple interpretations of what was in need of repair. And so for this study, I applied this definition more broadly to recognize the needs and issues that Ms. Hassan saw in her classroom and how those inevitably intersected with our work. And so to be expected, because um, we weren't in a bubble of like beautiful translanguaging pedagogies all the time, we had to really navigate the day-to-day -day environment while planning translanguaging pedagogies. And so one of our issues, and Ms. Hassan had um, classrooms of almost 30 kids each year, which is huge for a second grade classroom, because um, they're seven and eight year olds. And so um, we, her children in this classroom were very talkative. And so we talked about, um, Mrs. Hassan brings up here, you know, how do we figure out these kids from talking over each other? And this is a very casual conversation. And I talked about to her about how I would handle it. Like maybe we'd just do this routine or something. And so this excerpt comes from a longer conversation about taking turns with a talkative group of students and was one of many conversations surrounding the classroom environment and behavior. And so Ms. Hassan's concern with managing the energy in the room was so significant 
that I actually realized I needed to pause a little bit on the translanguaging pedagogies and maybe I could help her redesign her literacy block schedule and routine. So it'd provide more autonomy for the students and then she would be able to run small groups with more ease. And so I offered to co-teach and help with this routine and end up being a really successful part of her classroom day. And so listening to and collaborating with Ms. Sasan on the daily routines of her classroom, despite being outside of the realm of our research, was one example of sustained dialogue because it required that I move beyond my own personal agendas to help her with concerns. And another thing we also talked about, again, because we weren't in a bubble, we had to deal with a pretty strict and scripted curriculum. Um, and there were times where we thought there were aspects that were Injust and Mrs. San here, I'm alluding to her pressure that she has to do this midterm assessment with kids who weren't ready to take the midterm assessment. And Mrs. San was saying it's not justice to them, it's not fair. And so we spoke really frequently about how these this curriculum and having to do these assessments interfered with the more transformative aims of our project and our broader teaching philosophies. And so um, at times we resisted this pressure, pressure because it was counterproductive to translanguaging pedagogies. But we also together, I had to listen to Ms. Hassan and together we had to reconcile the testing schedule and the curriculum materials as well. And so with the sustained open dialogue, it really means that we were um, cognizant, especially me as the researcher of the in intersection of translanguaging pedagogies and issues in the classroom. And while part of PDR is reimagining these possibilities, um, frameworks in collaborative research don't negate, or at least I think these critical frameworks don't negate the very real like complexity and messiness inherent in doing such work. And so again, we made space for these concerns beyond and with our translanguaging pedagogies, understanding that these systemic pressures were involved in our project. Um, so another, um, another one of my themes was we did a lot, of course, did a lot of reflection on our roles in identities and research design and teaching. And so I really define that as the acknowledgement or description of role or identity in planning and in implementation. And so translanguaging, um, Ms. Hassan and I spent a significant amount of time reflecting on these roles and um, PDR acknowledges that our identities shape research processes and that we should not leave these influences out. Um, and so with our varying experiences, both as insiders and outsiders in various ways. So Ms. Hassan was a Somali woman and a community member. Um, I was a licensed language teacher and a former colleague, but I also was not a Somali woman, um, we were able to address these issues from very different but helpful vantage points. And so as a result, these themes, awareness of language use and how a certain level of commitment was required and part of our co-stance um, on language pedagogies were salient. And so um, trans, it sh I should let you know that translanguaging pedagogies weren't easy for either of us because I wasn't trained as a teacher in translanguaging pedagogies and neither was um, Ms. Hassan. Um, but as bilinguals, we obviously use translanguaging more informally to redirect students and help with conceptual understanding prior to doing research together. However, we didn't engage in these extensive and intentional planning cycles. And so our design and implementation processes led us to more explicitly reflect on the ways we used our linguistic repertoires and how students responded to our language use. And so Ms. Hassan asked, I asked Ms. Hassan about her role in an interview and she, and if she thought it changed over time. And so she shared how her own awareness of her language and the pressures of English as a Somali woman evolved as a result of our collaboration. And you can see here, she said she previously, because previous to being a teacher, she was also a bilingual liaison and, and an educational assistant in the context. And she says, I feel like I was using survival Somali to explain to the kids what they needed to know. Um, 
And then, but right now we're more academic focused. The goal is to use both languages that they can use, that they can do well academically and, you know, share their identity um, as well. So she was evolving um, in thinking about how she used her language. Um, and then also Ms. Hassan and I experienced difficulties in encouraging students to be comfortable with using their home and community languages. And some of this difficulty manifested into Ms. Hassan doing and I doing more of the talking as bilinguals or translanguagers. And at times just assuming our translanguaging would hopefully encourage the, the kids to translanguage as well. And so we're reflecting here, it's the struggle we're having is like us doing the talking. Ms. Hassan affirms, um, and yes, we can do the talking because we have this multilingual knowledge. And then Ms. Hassan says, yeah, but our goal was to let the kids talk more. Do you feel like we're talking more in Somali? And I should know I can do some basic Somali because of all my work. Um, so I was using Somali off and on as well. And so in this exchange, we're speaking of the difficulty to encourage more student translanguaging and we notice how we need to attend to these power dynamics and change our roles as the talkers and encourage more child agency in translanguaging as well. And so with this awareness um, of our identities and our roles and can't show you all the insights, but we work together to intentionally incorporate translanguaging pedagogies. And this led Ms. Hassan specifically to insights about mono monolingual bias and her own shame surrounding Somali use in the classroom. And some of these reflections that we ended up having alluded to the linguistic discrimination faced by many marginalized populations and not just, you know, students, but teachers as well. And aligned with the critical historicity element of PDR by reminding us why these translanguaging pedagogies were necessary um, as well. And then also by thinking about these lessons and how they were going more intentionally, we had some recognition of power dynamics between us and the students as well, and how we needed to change those. Um, and so another theme as we were reflecting on our identities and roles during this process was how a certain level of commitment was necessary to carrying out these translanguaging pedagogies, which I broadly understand as a long term commitment to the project, the community and the aims of translanguaging pedagogies. So Ms. Hassan um, said this actually quite a bit, either directly or indirectly, but, and I asked her about it as well in our final interview, um, asking her, you know, what, what do we need to think about if teachers and researchers need to work together? And she says, you need to find someone who's passionate about translanguaging that wants to make a change for the right reasons. And she clarifies, you know, um, that when you're making a commitment to change because you're making a commitment to change the system as well. Um, and so um, she really saw being committed to translanguaging pedagogies as part of making a change, a more transformative change and really addressing these inequities as well. Um, but she also acknowledged that there was a level of commitment that I brought to the table as well, and that the collaboration pushed her to keep at these translanguaging pedagogies. And I mean, I'm pretty type A and persistent. So, um, I, you know, I kept on wanting to try again. And luckily, I, we had that relationship, so we could. Um, and I acknowledged her, you know, personal expertise in translanguaging, though she gave me a little too much credit there. But then at the end of this conversation, um, I recognize and draw upon something she had said earlier in that I was like committed to the community and being there and knowing the students and the school, um, especially as a prior community member as well. And so, um, sorry, I'm just, I have too many screens going. And so, we developed a co-stance um, that recognized translanguaging pedagogies as a purposeful approach that required a commitment to social justice. And it points to what Garcia and Klein describe as a transformative orientation um, to translanguaging and 
aligns with the similar social justice aims um, of PDR. And so my involvement in the community were central parts to doing this work together and allowed us to dive more deeply into the pedagogies and do this work, um, I guess, more authentically. So giving feedback without discomfort, co-teaching pretty seamlessly, not all the time, but trusting each other. And so these different manifestations um, of commitment and really exemplify this endogenous nature of de human design processes, meaning that we believed that we could design from within. We believed that we could make changes through these iterative processes um, as well. And so I'm gonna move to research question number two. And this was, what were the pedagogical benefits of this collaboration? Because I do wanna talk about what we thought actually came out of this, not just our collaboration. And so there were two main findings, honoring student identity and then greater conceptual understanding. And so the second research question, um, we think really helped us outline, did we meet the transformative aims and practical goals that we had outlined in our planning? Um, and then again, I just wanna remind you, we did a variety of strategies, mostly focused on her small group reading, but also broader ones, um, such as the multilingual morning meeting, read alouds um, as well. And so our first theme um, we learned throughout our collaboration, which was, it was obvious before, but we didn't know how obvious and explicit it needed to be for the students, um, that building community and doing identity work, um, specifically surrounding multilingualism, had to be a primary goal. So even before we implemented these translanguaging strategies for reading lessons. So we recognized that lessons such as identity portraits and multilingual greetings really help students become more confident and curious about multilingualism and their own cultures. And so in this, in our final interview, Ms. Hassan alludes to this co-shift in asserting that this was our greatest improvement was recentering identity work with the students, acknowledging how we made assumptions and did not do enough multilingual ecology building in our first year. And so she said, we had an opportunity to improvement. And I think the start of the self portraits was allowing students to bring themselves as a whole. And she goes on to elaborate on that. And she also talked about how um, doing these types of activities um, led us to break our assumptions, even though we like thought we knew about the identities of children, we actually ended up learning um, that we had a lot more like second and third generation immigrant children in our classroom, students who had um, Filipino background, language backgrounds. And so it broke doing these types of activities were successful because it not only honored student identity and built their confidence, but it did break our own assumptions and it helped us differentiate and connect to students in different ways as well. Um, and just another example of Ms. Hassan explaining how, how helpful this was. She says, without the collaboration, I don't think me specifically, but our processes, you make this room to be a room that is so diversified and welcoming of everyone. And she acknowledged that this was unique, not to say that like she didn't have colleagues or other teachers who valued this, but because of the time we had together, um, she noted, you know, I don't think that happens anywhere in the building except our room, that room. That's what she's referring to as well. Um, and so this benefit um, or this benefit of our collaborative processes um, really helped us make a co-shift towards identity building projects. And Ms. Hassan again also commented how our collaboration manifested into an environment that was likely um, different in comparison to other classrooms that were not engaging all the time in these types of pedagogies as well. Um, and this, the next theme, which is one of my last themes, um, is students' greater conceptual understanding. And so Ms. Hassan and I talked extensively because part of the goal was to gain reading comprehension, my larger project, and think about how translanguaging impacts reading comprehension. Um, and so we talked extensively about how these strategies were impacting students' conceptual understanding. And this was a practical goal of the project, but yet, 
part of this larger ethical co-stance that children should be empowered to use all of their linguistic resources during reading um, as well. And so in this interaction, I'm just like noting like the Somali's working, it's working because we had, whoops, we had a lot of challenges. Um, and then I bring up, you know, it's working because when you explained hibernation in Somali, did you see how Hamdi translated that back in English to me? And so in this interaction, Ms. Hassan and I agreed that Ms. Hassan's um, explanation helped Hamdi and gain conceptual understanding of the word hibernation. And this was a common observation because in our interviews and our planning sessions, we highlighted several instances in which um, translingual explanations or bilingual vocabulary supports enhanced student learning. Um, and just another example, because I like um, this example is I asked her about it again and Ms. Hassan said, you know, I would 100% say the translanguaging help. Look at how when we were explaining kulul, which is hot, they know the stove is hot, the shit is hot, the sun is hot. How many ways did they say that? Even when we went on the bus, Hamza was like, it's so kulul there. Um, and so that was, he's using both languages. Um, and so we recognize this as a benefit um, as of our collaboration because we are able to think more deeply and reflect upon how is this happening. And so this really draws upon um, our, um, our agreement and our philosophy towards the heterogeneity of knowledge production, which is also part of these um, community and collaborative um, research processes and led to deeper synthesis of how these pedagogies worked or not for students' conceptual understanding, leading to even more iterative co-design and co-shift processes that weren't only responsive, but they empowered like Hamza right there, students to use Somali in different ways as well. Um, because I should note that at the beginning, at each beginning of the year, we really struggled with the students getting to speak Somali and being comfortable with it just because we were in an English medium classroom. It wasn't, you know, the norm. And so I'm still synthesizing um, my data, but I just want to end with a few things I'm thinking about. And so we redefined and reconfigured collaboration in ways that worked for us. So I knew Ms. Hassan had limited time, so she was okay with me doing some of the more intense research load, um, which because we knew this about each other and we were able to work so well together, this resulted in significant and really powerful benefits for the classroom community. And I think this was possible because of our continued relationship. Um, not that it's not possible to have deep relationships when you meet someone for the first time, but we were able to make space for both the personal, you can hear in our planning sessions, we're always, you know, talking about like, how are your kids? How is this? Um, what do you think about this? You know, I was knowledgeable of our colleagues in second grade. So we were able to have that really um, fun and personal relationship. But I also think it was our significant time inside and outside of the classroom as well. Ms. Hassan referred to in our interviews that we were both willing to spend a few hours outside of school in coffee shops and dig into this. Um, and then we also eventually, um, it wasn't easy at the beginning, especially during our first year, um, establishing these consistent co-design processes. And so um, I'm drawing on Miguel Zavala here um, because I think what we need to, in order to understand PDR and other collaborative research processes are really these ethnographies of design activity that will assist um, us in how we come about the design, what voices are included, excluded, how the entire research process is shaped. And while I don't do all of this, of course, here, I do think this study offers small glimpses of PDR processes and processes of co-designing translanguaging pedagogies, which are very underdocumented in the literature. And so just some quick implications um, research wise, I think it's really important as a partner, um, research partner, time and space for teachers needs, you know, that allowed Mrs. Hassan to realize, I think that I was okay with the mess. I, she, she didn't need to be perfect in front of me and we could figure things out together. Translanguaging wasn't just my 
only goal was really to be there for the betterment of the students. A time commitment beyond research. There were days where, even though I didn't have all the time in the world, where there was something happening in the classroom and I could see like a kid needed help or a redirection. And so I was committed to being there for those small moments as well. And then also something that really built um, our relationship and um, our, I guess our whole study together was co-teaching and being able to do that together. And so teaching wise, I don't think that these types of processes have to be limited to researchers and teachers. I really think um, there's not enough time in schools to really partner together and find peers to investigate. And so um, just to conclude, and again, I'm still thinking about all of this, but uh, we really centered partnership and students above all. And at times, maybe our pedagogies weren't so streamlined, but we considered this really a learning process together. And I really draw on Wynne and Yuri Bays, who are a researcher, um, teacher, team, um, in that I was a worthy witness, Mrs. Hassan, I really had the privilege of being in Ms. Hassan's classroom so much and getting to do things with her and realizing that me as a researcher and especially a former elementary teacher, I could never accept this luxury of just sitting and watching when there's so much work to do in our schools. And so I just wanna end with a funny quote because Ms. Hassan was, we were talking about how I was learning Somali and how I had to like teach myself Somali and Ms. Hassan says, you know, you have to be willing to do that. And I said, yeah, because you're not gonna have a Mrs. San or a Somali woman to help you. And she ends with, well, not everyone has a Leah, which I think really characterizes how much we appreciated each other. So that's all I have. So please feel free to ask questions and reach out if you need anything. Thank you, Leah. Uh, that was a great presentation. There's already been a lot of active um, commenting and questioning in the chat. Um, so I'm going to do my best to get through these questions and um, I invite folks to continue asking questions in the chat. So the first question is from Amanda and she asks, um, through your sort of co-reflexivity, did you find that Ms. Hassan developed a living theory of linguistic justice that moved into leadership efforts to effect change beyond her own classroom? Yeah, there were a few instances. I will say um, this, a lot of this research was focused in her classroom and it was given all the responsibilities Mrs. Hassan had. She was on other leadership teams as well. Didn't necessarily go too much beyond, but she did take some of the activities we did um, and pass them along to other teachers in the grade level and they ended up picking them up like our identity portraits. Um, and a translation activity. She actually adapted that for an international night. Um, so yeah, so I think she, she definitely expanded it. We definitely talked um, and COVID kind of put stops on some things about, you know, doing more professional development together for the staff as well. Um, and so that's something we talked about, but I think um, it really helped her realize, um, you helped her develop more of a philosophy on language and multilingualism. Not that, she, I mean, she was living and breathing it every day as a multilingual, but she wasn't necessarily trained as a language teacher and wasn't trained in translanguaging at all prior to this. Um, so I kind of brought in that piece and we were able to reflect together. So your the last part of your response to this question is actually a nice lead into the next question from Martha. And Martha asks, as a result of your research, what are the key parts of translanguaging pedagogy that you felt were applied and at what junctures? Um, so because Ms. Hassan didn't have this background, how did her consciousness related to translanguaging pedagogy evolve? Yeah, our first year, I would say, um, I mean, it was really a struggle because I think Ms. Hassan, like, again, like was translanguaging all the time, but I was trying to push us towards, um, especially I was undergoing, you know, some philosophical, philosophical shifts as well. And um, trying to push us towards things that were more transformative. Um, and so, and that we often talked about, especially after our first year, that translanguaging pedagogies didn't just mean her 
talking in Somali all the time or translating things for the kids, but that we had to, you know, work towards more child agency. So I would say that was one of the main things, which we were able to move towards, towards the end, um, I think. So I guess one, I guess, key thing was like translanguaging pedagogies involved child agency. It's not just the teacher doing these translation things as well. And what was the second part of the question? Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so just the sort of a expansion was that Ms. Hassan did not have background in translanguage, yeah. ped, translanguage and pedagogy. So how did her consciousness evolve? Yeah, and so I believe she did, I think she began to think more transformatively about translanguaging specifically um, towards the end of it and that we needed to do more of these identity things and make space for it. And then again, um, you know, make it more child-centered at times. Um, but again, she, I think some of our tension in this process was the fact that she had so much pressure. And she said this in an interview to boost the kids' reading scores um, and have them move up in levels. And so she was like, I have to do English, 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 <laughs> you know? And so I think there was tension in believing that, you know, is this going to take away from like what we're doing? Like, but I mean, at the end of the day, she trusted me too. And because of our relationship, I was able to be like, okay, Mrs. Hassan, let's do, let's shift and do this. And um, I just feel lucky that we were able to be so open in that way, so. Yeah, there was actually another question in the chat related to language use. And I don't know if you can comment on this or not, because I know your focus was a little bit different in your study, but the question was about what was the, what was the balance between use of Somali and use of English and um, how, was there a language that dominated and what were some of the tensions that, that came up in relation to um, sort of switching back and forth between the two languages? Yeah, it was um, the first year I would say we would have, I mean, it really depended on the lesson too and the content. If there was something that the kids, did not know and we knew we could or Miss Hassan you know had a more intuitive sense than I did about like what could be explained in Somali then there would be lessons or chunks of time where it would be all Somali but sometimes when they were um, a little more like abstract concepts at times or things when Miss Hassan was like the kids don't necessarily have that background in Somali either um, there would be lessons where we intended to do some translanguaging strategies, but it would be all, all in English. And so, um, and again, Miss Hassan had that intuitive sense in our planning sessions, we would talk about, oh, if we talk about main idea and details of a story, is this going to be something that makes sense to the kids? in Somali, um, do they have that background? Um, and the thing with it, what the kids have all of this knowledge, right? But we were fig trying to figure out, especially because the Somali students in this population were sometimes first generation immigrants, but also sometimes second, third generation immigrants. And so the different varieties of Somali, the different ways they use Somali in their um, families were so, diverse that we, even though Miss, I had the luxury of a Somali woman, we were still like, how do we meet the linguistic needs and backgrounds of all of these students? So I would say there were times where Somali dominated, but there were also times where English dominated. And that's what I struggled with as a researcher was trying to like, should I push us to do this one way or just let it roll because Miss Hassan is the classroom teacher and the bilingual, the Somali English bilingual, so. Yeah, I mean, I think your answer to this question sort of underscores the layers of complexity when we're thinking yeah. about translanguaging pedagogies, right? Yeah. Um, so there have been a couple of questions, one from Muhammad and one from Maxwell regarding indigenous languages and minoritized languages related to translanguaging pedagogies. And so I know this is a little bit outside of the scope of what you're talking about, but let me read uh, one of the questions. I think it covers uh, what both people were asking about. Um, <clears throat> so the question is, I wonder if you have any thoughts about how translanguaging approaches might either work or not work with indigenous languages, and you could add minoritized languages to that too. I'm thinking both about indigenous language in the United States, as well as many Latinx children who are indigenous who speak Spanish and Mayan, Zapotec, Mazatec, etc. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about that? 
I do, you know, and that's something I struggle with. And I'm not, again, not an expert in indigenous languages um, and other varieties that are really not, I mean, they're present in our classrooms, but not really drawn upon. And so translanguaging wise, I think there are definitely spaces where we need to protect. Um, and I'm thinking of like Ojibwe immersion schools and things like that, where we do need to protect languages. So there's always that balance um, and you don't want to shame the kids for using what is probably natural to them going between languages every day. So I don't, I guess I don't have a lot of advice, but I recognized um, kind of the sacredness of having spaces where kids could just use Ojibwe or Mayan um, too as well. So I'm not sure, but that's something I think a lot of my colleagues who work with indigenous languages um, and other less common languages, that's something I'm looking forward to reading more about. And I think I actually just saw like a call for a special issue in applied linguistics on translanguaging and in indigenous languages. And so I'm looking forward to that work from my colleagues. Yeah, and your response, I think, touches a little bit on what the follow-up question was about this yeah. from Muhammad about the role of translanguaging pedagogies in keeping minoritized languages yeah. vital, the, ensuring the vitality of these languages yeah. and the preservation of these languages. So, um, okay, so there's another question. This next question is about um, sort of attitudes towards translanguaging pedagogies, and it comes from um, Banka Karn, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. So the question is, we all understand that translanguaging is an instrumental tool to maximize students' content learning. However, translanguaging is not everyone's cup of tea, especially some parents. In your research, do you have a chance to promote an understanding of translanguaging pedagogies to parents in order to shift their language ideologies from mono to multilingual perspectives? This is a really good question. We weren't able to do as much of, as we liked, but um, the nice thing about my relationship to the context was I actually knew a lot of the parents because I had taught their um, taught siblings in the years before. Miss Hassan had a very open door classroom, um, and so there were always like Somali parents coming in and out, um, and in general, parents coming in and out. So they were able to see our pedagogies in action. We were able to stop sometimes and be like, this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. I don't know that I can say, you know, parents ideologies change, but I definitely agree that there is this, um, there are definitely monolingual ideologies. And I think for good reasons from a lot of our immigrant parents, because they want their kids to be successful. They want them to go to college. They want them, you know, they want the best for their children. So I like I totally get that, especially as an ESL teacher. But one of the key things we did at the beginning of each school year was um, I introduced myself at the open house and said, hey, I'm going to be in Miss Fur or Miss Hassan's classroom a lot. Um, this is what we're doing. Um, that also gave us a chance, you know, to do consent forms and pass out things. Um, but so they were able to say hi to me, ask questions, um, and they thought it was really cool. And I actually had a parent who, she was Dutch and um, she was Dutch heritage or from, and so she came in and was giving a tour to other parents. And she said, this is one of the only classrooms that recognizes my students like Dutch heritage and Dutch language background. It's so cool that they use Dutch in their morning meeting. And so there was definitely some positives, but I can't say that like I changed like ideologies, I would say, cause it just wasn't part of my research project, but we did get like lots of positive feedback. Okay, so this next question is actually a question that I had and it's one from Kendall and it's about the relationship that you have with Ms. Hassan. So you talked about the fact that you already had a relationship with her having been a teacher yeah. in the same school with her. And so the question is, can you see ways that this relationship could transfer to more regular partnerships without such a long history and personal connection? Do you think that the relationship, that the efficacy of the research would be the same? Would there be barriers? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's something I think about a lot, especially as I'm going into a faculty position in the fall where I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to, you know, start from, you know, square one with these relationships. And 
I think it can, you know, I think it was both a great thing that Miss Hassan and I knew each other so well. And it was also a hard thing because it made me really question some of my steps sometimes when I'm like, this is Miss Hassan. She's my friend first, you know, and research second. Um, and so I think there is, but I think, as I mentioned in the implications, I think things like being able to be flexible with um, the teacher, you know, I, it's not always possible, but I think volunteering and something I see a lot in participatory design research and I think more critical and effective models of collaborative research is being able to be there for things beyond your research too, or saying, you know, let me help you teach a lesson or let me help you, let me pull a small group you know, and I know we're not like all licensed educators, but um, if you have that capacity saying like, how can I help you in other ways? So it is more reciprocal. And, um, and I think that's a possibility beyond the type like Mrs. San and I knowing each other. So I guess I would say like, yeah, focus on these issues or elements of being able to share your expertise in ways beyond the research as well. Um, so there have been a couple of questions about um, materials that were used in the classroom, one from Evenia and one from uh, Darren. So I'm going to ask Darren's question and try to weave in the issues that Evenia raised as well. So Darren says, I imagine a big reason why more teachers, even those who understand the benefits of nurturing students' home languages, don't use translanguaging pedagogies is because there's a lack of materials. Was this an obstacle you faced when planning? And then the sub question from Avenia is, when you selected materials, how did you do so in a way to avoid cultural bias? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, I would definitely say one of the obstacles for us too, and I've talked about that in other um, studies or part of my dissertation, it was the lack of materials, especially because Somali is a less common language. And so we really, we spent, I mean, so much time, even just like creating like the bilingual vocabulary charts um, together in our like planning session. So I would definitely say the materials is an obstacle. And again, not everyone has a Miss Hassan to help you make Somali materials. Like you really don't. And so, um, and there were times where I depended on her, but there were also times where Mrs. Sun didn't have time to like just sit and make materials for hours. So I would make the vocabulary chart and have her quickly look at it. Cause I'd use like Google translate or a few of the Somali like picture books and things I have. Um, so yeah, materials were really hard. And that's something I think that in order to be more sustainable for teachers, we need, we need to figure that out or start sharing, I think, um, resources. I know there are plenty on the internet, but I think if we can start creating repositories of like resources we used for translanguage and pedagogies or bil bilingual materials, you know, I mean, I was just using bilingual picture books and things like that, um, that would make them more accessible for teachers. And I know there's already some of that out there, but there aren't actually like manip manipulatives or worksheets or things like that. And then the second one, cultural bias. Um, I typically refer to my own expertise as a teacher in um, selecting like culturally responsive texts and like using checklists and things like that um, in my own like knowledge and research over the years. But I was also lucky because there's obviously cultural nuances, I don't know, as a non-Somali woman um, to have Miss Hassan. So she was able to say, not necessarily tell me whether things were biased, but whether things were appropriate for the children and their age group and things like that. Because we also were looking at like these folk tales and they were very scary and things. I was like, oh, what does this say? Is this like cool? And she's like, no, you can't do this. These kids are seven year olds. And so I just like trusted her cultural knowledge there. Well, you have excellent timing, Leah, because we are at one o'clock. Um, there are lots more questions, but I'm afraid we don't have time to get to them. We want to be respectful of Leah's time and we want to be respectful of everybody who's here in attendance. So Leah, thank you so much for this really engaging talk. 
you, I think, drew the largest audience of any Carla presentation that we've had <laughs> since we moved them online. So congratulations for that. Thank you to everybody in the audience who attended. And we hope that we will see you at another Carla talk this semester. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.